This week on Woodworking with Wes, I want to show you a round oak table that we found online and we decided it was too much money. I mean way too much money. And so we built our version of it. The one that we saw online was over $2,500. It was unbelievable how much money it was and I don't know how anybody could afford that. But anyway, we decided to make our version of it. We went ahead and we made a round oak table. And by the way, if you make a round table, you can make it any kind of wood you want. But we wanted to make ours oak like the one we saw. And so we made a cross pedestal. We made a nice wood top. We made our own kind of finish on it to give it our own little flavor. But I want you to follow along as I build this table and then wait till the end. I'm going to add up how much money I spent to build it and you can see how much money you can save. To start off on our table, the first thing we're going to work on is the table top. We're going to be 42 inches in diameter and so I drew me out a 42 inch circle so that I could begin to cut my lengths on my hardwood. Now, let me introduce you to the hardwood we're going to use for the top. This is five quarter hit and miss and by hit and miss we mean that it has been planed, thickness planed at the mill to only just hit and miss. So there's some parts that are not plain and most parts that are. So it still needs to have a smooth surface put on both sides and it's rough stock on the edges. So S2S or hit and miss two sides and then rough edges. We're going to chunk this off to lengths. By chunk I mean I'm going to cut it into chunks that are the right size for me to begin to put my tabletop together. And I've already got some of it done here. I'm going to put my gloves on so that I can eliminate some of the splinters that are uh, possible on the edges. I cut two pieces to start off in the middle. Here's my center. You can see I marked my two boards center. I've cut them a little long so that after it's all glued together and everything, I can still go ahead and cut it round. So these are the two pieces I would put to center. Then I've got two more pieces that I have chunked and they'll go to the outside edges like this. And I will continue to cut my pieces until I have enough to cover my full circle. Before I start gluing together though, I've got to get this edge taken away. This rough mill edge has got to be cut away. Now these boards have been ripped fairly straight. I'm not going to joint them. I'm just going to take them over to my table saw and do what I call straight line. I'll take the straightest edge that each board has and I'll rip off the mill edge and turn it around and cut off the other mill edge and that we'll call that being a straight line. That's what I call straight line. So let's go over to the table saw and straight line this piece of wood so you can see what I'm doing. I have installed our rip blade for ripping hardwood. Ripping is when you cut with the grain. Cross cut is when you cut across the grain. We're ripping. So we've installed our rip blade. We've set it just a little bit more than the thickness of the wood. We'll put our tape measure on here. Measure, we're six and a half inches wide. And so let's set our saw at about six and three eighths inches wide. We're going to set it six and five sixteenths. We'll turn on our dust collector and we'll take one rip down this side. Now we have a clean edge on our board from our saw. We'll turn it around, set our dimension just a little bit less and rip off this mill edge and we'll go back and forth a couple of times making sure that we have a super clean edge and if you'll notice on the back of this board right here we have a little bit of an issue with the thickness of our wood because this is toward the outside of the log and we're going to cut that off because we want to maintain the full thickness of our tabletop. Just watch as I go through and do this. Dust collector.
Turn it around one more time. One last time, turn it around. Now we want to cut off that piece. So we take a measurement. I need to cut it five and three quarters in order to take that off. Okay, now this piece is ready for glue up. We have two clean edges, and we're not going to worry about the surfacing of this, and let me explain that to you when we get it all glued up. I have all of my pieces cut to size, straight lined, and I laid it out here on my clamps. Now, I've just laid the clamps on here so that I know what configuration of clamps that I want to put. Let me take these off, like this. I also have marked a line on here so I make sure that I have them lined up correctly. And I've set my clamps in a way that I can turn my boards up here now. And I'm going to just turn them like this. And then I'll take my bottle of glue and glue down each piece. We're not going to use bi biscuits or dominoes or anything like that because we're going to be cutting this tabletop round and we don't want to have any of those exposed by accident. So we're just going to face glue these just like this. So let's get started here. Let me put on my glasses. We filled up our glue bottle. We're ready to go. And we're going to use plenty of glue so that we have plenty of squeeze out because that's all that's holding this top together is just the glue. And it will be enough to hold this top together. We don't have to worry about that. As long as we have plenty of glue on there. And when we put it together, we have plenty of squeeze out. Our glue up will be sufficient to hold our top together. You can see I'm putting a nice big heavy bead of glue on my pieces. Gonna come around here and catch up with this all the way out to the end of our boards. This uh, this is just tight bond glue that I'm using, tight bond yellow glue original. I'm not using waterproof or anything like that. This is just regular straight tight bond glue and this is sufficient, like I say, to make sure this top is glued together. As we put the pieces together, I'm gonna just kind of rub them a little bit like this to spread, help spread that glue. Each piece that I put in there, I'll just do that a little bit and that'll help spread the glue. Okay, the lines that I've drawn on here help me make sure as I put this back together, as I rub the pre-glued glued pieces together, I make sure that I have my boards exactly where I want them. One of the other things that I did as you glue up any kind of a, a glue up, you want to alternate the crowns of your board. Now the crown, let me point out the crown. The crown is the rings of the, the log. So you want to point the rings up and down and up and down and up and down, and that makes a better glue up. Okay, we're gonna tighten our clamps, and we're gonna tighten our clamps a little at a time all the way across so that we put an even amount of pressure as we go. All right, 
you can begin to see our squeeze out. That's what we're looking for. Good squeeze out. We want our squeeze out to be fairly even because that indicates that we have a good straight edge glue up all the way along. Okay, and we are, we're getting good even squeeze out along our seams. That shows that we had good flat even seams. And I'm going to put two clamps across the top here. And that helps hold our glue up flat and continues to put pressure on our seams to make sure that they are tight. Okay. Okay, we'll just keep cinching it down all the way across, making sure that I can tell by how far the tension on my clamp that I'm just about evened pressure all the way across. Okay, this looks great. Good squeeze out on all of our seams. Really good. Okay, we're going to let this dry a minimum of an hour, but I'm actually going to give it two hours. This is a big glue up. We're going to give it two hours. I'll see you at the end of that. I forgot to mention we did not surface our wood before we clamped it up. So you've got some hit and miss spots on here where the rough wood is still available, or uh, not available, but shows. The reason being is after this is all glued up and cleaned up, ready to and dry, we're going to take this to a local cabinet shop that we know of, and we have going to rent some wide belt sanding time, and we're going to sand this tabletop down so that it's even and smooth all the way along. Now, it costs a little bit of money to rent wide belt sanding time, but the amount of time that you save and the better sanding that you will receive from a wide belt will offset any cost. So let's get her dried up and cleaned up. All right, we've let our top dry. Let's take the clamps off. I know we're, we've let it dry long enough. We're in good shape. Our beads have all dried. Our squeeze outs have all dried. And we want to be able to have them scraped off a little bit for when we go to our wide belt sander. I have a big glue scraper here. This is a glue scraper that my brother made for me years ago. And it's a, it's a great glue scraper because it's so heavy. And we're going to do this to all the seams so that it's nice and cleaned off. And then we're ready to go to the cabinet shop that we're having wide belt this and have them do it for us. We're back from having our top wide belted. While we were there, we also had some additional four quarter stock wide belted that we're going to be using for our legs. Let's, that's what we're going to be working on next is our legs. And I drew out a configuration of our leg. This is the floor down here. This will be a bottom stretcher from leg to leg. Our legs will be at a 10 degree angle and there'll be a top plate that will screw to the underneath side of our top. I drew a little diagram here. Here's our top. Our legs are going to be a crisscross, so there's going to be two configurations of this that will go together like that, crisscross. We'll, I'll show you how that all works. And that will make the base pedestal. This joint right down here is what I'm going to work on first. I did a mock-up of it right here, and I'll show you how that goes together. This would be our piece that is against the floor. It has two outside pieces, but it has a longer inside piece. Our upright piece is just the opposite to create almost a tongue and groove type situation, and they'll go together like that. Be glued, clamped, and we're gonna put a screw in there just to make sure that it's extra heavy duty and it will withstand any kind of abuse and use that we wanna give it. But that is going to be the configuration of our legs. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to go to the table saw and we're going to rip all of our stock 
into two and three eighths. That's the, the width of our stock that we have. We're gonna rip it to two and three eighths. We had it milled to just a little under seven eighths and three thicknesses puts together makes our little beam. The first thing we've got to do is to rip all of our stock into the two and three eighths. I have my rip blade I'll put on my saw, my fence set at two and three eighths, and we'll fire up our dust collector and get started. Coming back to our layout, we're going to do our legs first. I, like I say, I've cut all of my stock to my two and three eighths. I've gone ahead and I've cut a few pieces to 10 inch. And the way we're going to do this, one piece will go like this. I'll use the same width of our stock. This is just a cutoff piece. I'll use that piece for a spacer, put it down there. We'll attach this piece and then we'll write right over the top of it with the next piece, bringing it out flush to make our leg. Now, first thing we need to do, however, is to cut all the pieces we just ripped to a 10 degree angle on the bottom. So let's go do that first. We've reinstalled our 50 tooth combination blade for a smoother cross cut on our leg pieces. We have set our push fence at 10 degrees and we're just going to take the end off of each one of these boards at 10 degrees. Let's show you how. Just like that. And we'll do that to all of our pieces for our legs. With all of our pieces cut to 10 degrees, we're ready to put our, the leg together. Uh, first thing we're gonna do though, is we're going to take, because the saw always leaves a little bit of a, a burr, I always take a little piece of just scrap sandpaper and just go around and get off all those little feathers. We've talked about feathers before and I like to get rid of those feathers when you do a glue up so they're not in the way. Okay. And three pieces for each leg. All right, now, I haven't cut them to length because we're going to cut them to length after they're all done and we'll cut them to length so they'll all be consistent. The first thing we'll do is put our center piece on. We're gonna use this, this is a, a cut off piece of our stock. We're gonna use that for our spacer. We're gonna make sure that it's flush out to this end like this and flush along the length of our leg. Now, if you need, you can put a piece like this and hold it there and that helps you flush it to make it flush. Same thing here, but you can feel and make sure that it's okay. We're gonna use a little glue. This, now we're nailing the inside piece. So I'm gonna give myself a little mark here with my pencil to know where to put the glue. We're not gonna use a lot of glue. We don't want a ton of squeeze out, but we want enough glue that we have a good adhesion with glue because this is going to be what holds it mostly. I'm gonna put a small bead of glue, but three of them. Okay, we'll put our piece of wood on there. Put our spacer block and our spacer block. Hold that tight to the end. Okay, make sure we're smooth all the way up. Yes, we're doing good. All right, like that. I put inch and a quarter nails in my brad nailer, my eight, 18 gauge brad nailer. Okay, whoop, it moved on me. Gotta be careful with that glue on there. It kinda has a tendency to slide. So I'm gonna leave my spacer block in place while I make my first nail. Make sure that I'm, oh good, I'm right where I wanna be. Now I can go all the way down. And I don't wanna go too high because I'm gonna be cutting this leg off. So what we're going to do to complete our 
deal is we're going to put some clamps on it, but not yet. Okay, now, now comes our third piece. It's going to go like this, again, with our glue. Three light beads is the way I'm doing it. To make sure I have enough glue, but not too much. This always allows me to not have too much squeeze out because I don't want a lot of squeeze out in places that it doesn't belong. Okay, now to make these ends flush, I stand my little spacer stick on the end and hold it tight to the table and tight to the end of my leg. Okay, I gotta make sure it doesn't move on me here. And I'm just gonna give it one nail here. And up part way and give it one more nail. I don't want a lot of nails in here because I don't want to have to putty and sand a lot of nails. I want the majority of my holding to be clamps and glue. So we'll put a clamp right here. And we're going to clamp way up high here. And plenty of clamps to make sure that you've got a good, tight clamp all the way down. This is where you need about a million clamps. But I have enough. Not a million, but close. Okay. All right. You can see here we don't have, I have a little bit of squeeze out here and here. A couple other spots I got a little bit there. Flip it over. Yeah, we're nice. But my joints are nice and tight. And I'll take some uh, wood putty and putty those before we sand them. But that's the way each one of our legs are going to go together. So you can see how that matches up with our prototype. Just like that. Okay, we're going to build four of these. I'll come back when we're done. With our legs all glued together now, ready to go, now it's time to work on our bottom stretcher, which will go the width of our leg. Well, not the width, but that's the width of our pedestal. This distance is 28 inches, but I have a little foot on the bottom here, so it's, it's like 27 and, a, and three quarters of an inch from outside to outside, but we're not going to have the crisscross piece be the same length both ways. It's going to be 28 inches this way and 24 inches this way. So it will give an effect of being a little longer than it is wide. Not by much, but just enough to give it a little bit of variance. First thing we're going to do, so here's our leg pieces and here's our stretcher piece. Remember they go together like this. Okay, this is the piece right here. This center piece is the one that needs to be our 27 and 3 quarters. So let's cut this piece first. Let's go over to the table saw and cut it. Then we're going to show you how we're going to measure these outside pieces on both sides. After we have cut a 10 degree angle on one end of our board, we're going to flip it around so that we can cut our end on the other side. Now our angles need to be facing one another. Measurement long point to long point, 27 and 3 quarters. Okay, and let's mark a little bit of that on the outside so that we can see that. Now with our stick turned around, we can cut our other angle. And like I say, the angles come together like this. We'll line that up with our saw and make that cut. And there we are. We can see just a little bit of our mark there. It means we're just right. 27 and 3 quarters, long point to long point. Let's go back over our bench and mark it so we can determine how long our outside pieces are. We're coming back to our spacer stick. We're going to put our spacer stick right here to the outside edge. I'm actually going to use this for a, a support piece because I really want this measurement to be accurate. OK, 
Okay. We're going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to use that block, and you can see how having it tied up against there allows my spacer stick a place to push up to. And so if I push all of it tight against that block and then make my mark, I get an exact measurement of what I need. Okay, now we take our tape measure. We're going to burn an inch. Now, by burning an inch, I always what I'm talking about is measuring from the one inch mark because the end of your tape measure sometimes moves in a way that allows your measurement to be incorrect when you're after an exact measurement. So we're going to burn an inch and we're going to come out here and we are 23 and 15 sixteenths, but we burn an inch, so it's 22 and 15 sixteenths long point to long point is what we need. Now, I'm going to do something here that I want to check my measurement, measure twice, cut once. Here's one time where that rule really comes into play. Measure twice, cut once. Actually, I'm not quite 15 sixteenths. I'm closer to 7 eighths. So I'm going to cut it 22 and 7 eighths. All right. So 27 and 3 quarters, right where we want to be. 22 and 7 eighths. If we're a little too much or, or in here, that would throw off our connection. Oh, wrong one. If we were too much, that would throw off our connection. Oh, wrong way. There we go. That would throw off our connection. So what we want to do is if we're a little short, when we, if, we're, if we have a little too much of this centerpiece sticking out, when we go to sand this all, we can just sand that off. It's easier to do that than it is to be too long. So we're going to go 22 and 7 eighths is going to be our side pieces. Back to our table saw and cut the same way that we did before on this. Okay, now that we have our center piece done, this is one of the side pieces. Let's see how we did. Now we want to line up with the lines that we already put on there. And so what I did is I went around to the bottom side and I put an ever so small mark there. I'm going to turn it on edge like this. And I'm going to line up and I'm going to face that toward you. And you can see my little lines that I made line up right there perfectly with the piece that I just cut. So now this is the outside, this is the center piece, and there'll be another piece on the other outside just exactly like it. Just like that. And that's the way we're going to make our cross pieces in the center. One of these 27 and 3 quarters, the other one will be 23 and 3 quarters. Let's get that far and then we're going to come back and show you how we're going to put those together. We have our stretchers made. This is our long one, this is our short one. I wanted to take my mock-up piece and basically stick it on here so you can see how this is going to go together. This is going to represent my upright pieces that we've already glued together. But you can see how quickly that just is going to slide together and make a wonderful strong joint once that's glued and has a screw in it. But let's go ahead and let this all dry, all of these pieces, and then we're going to come back and we're going to sand the pieces before we assemble to one or 80 grit and then 120. And then I'm going to show you how we're going to set up the cross on these. And I've got to cut these to length. I made them long, so we've got to cut them to length. So that's the next step. We have measured the height of our leg and determined that it needs to be 27 and a quarter long point to short point. We're still going to be cutting it at the 10 degree angle, and so we've made a line here, 10 degrees here. We've already got our 10 degrees here. We've set our saw blade so that it's a little more than half the distance through our wood because we're going to cut one direction and then turn it around and cut the other direction. We've put a, a safety block here on our saw so that as we push our wood through, the end of our stock will be beyond the pressure against the fence. And we've also checked the distance of our miter gauge will be beyond the saw blade, so we'll be able to safely remove our leg once we've made our cut. Let's go ahead and cut one piece and show you. Okay, we've got it set there to the distance. Let's make sure our mark is good. We still are 
Turn our saw on. Okay, now we can safely remove our leg. We'll go ahead and cut all of our legs this side first before we turn it around so that we're consistent. We've reset our miter gauge the other direction, turned our board over, and reset our block over on this side. So the way we'll do it is we'll put our wood against the block, turn on our saw, There we are. And we'll go ahead and finish cutting those legs. Now they've been sanded 80 grit and we'll finish sanding them to 120 grit and putty them so that we're ready to put the legs together before we start working on the bottom stretchers. After we had cut all of the legs, the upright portion of our legs, to length, we sanded them to 120 and now we're ready to work on the crisscross stretchers these pieces are going to go together like this to create the crisscross effect that I was talking about. Now we're going to put these together with what is called a half lap joint. A half lap joint is basically where you take a notch out of one piece and then take a notch out of the other piece and both of these notches are halfway through and they correspond to make a half lap joint. So let's go over the table saw. We're set up. I have marked on the bottom of my stretcher the portion that I need to cut out. Now this particular stretcher, this is the shorter one, and I'm going to actually take the notch out of the top side so that the other one sits on top of it. But I've marked it on the bottom side so that I know where I am. And I have set up my fence with a, a sacrificial block. And I want you to see, I'm going to push this right up to the saw. You can see how my saw is set on the inside of my line. And I have set it to the height that I want. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one cut this way and then a couple of nibbles. And then I'm going to turn it around and take another cut this way. And that will be the outside cuts to my notch. And then I'm going to just take successive cuts to finish out in the middle. Now I could do this with a dado blade, but I wanted to do it with a single blade just to show you how it's done with a single blade. Now again, like I say, we're going to be taking our cut out of the top of this blade. So let's turn our stretcher upside down, put it against our stop block, and get ready. Let's turn on our dust collector and get cut. Now while we're all set up, we'll go ahead and continue to make all of the cuts to clear this piece of wood out totally, and that will be this section of the half lap. Let's check ourselves to see if we made the right cuts. This is a scrap piece from our cutoff, and we should, now see how we're right there? You can see how we're lining up. We should be the same on the other side, and look at that, we are. Let's put that right there like that. And you can see how our cut, our notch, is the, exactly the width that we need to have. And so let's go ahead and finish cutting this out. Then we're going to do the same thing to our other stretcher. Only we'll make the cuts on the bottom side and it will fit over. And then these two levels will be the same. And that will be our half lap joint. We'll come back when we get that all done. With both sides of our half lap joint cut, let's show you how it goes together. We're just gonna dry fit this because we have another step to do before we put it together. But you can see once this is pounded down and glued together, how that creates a lap joint that will be flush and smooth all the way across. And that's a half lap joint. Okay, before we go ahead and do that half lap joint, however, we're going to put the uprights 
on our stretchers. So let's step over here. Here's our upright. Our stretcher will be over the top like this. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm just going to put one on, show you, and then I'll come back and do the rest of them. But we're going to, this is a glue joint that will have a screw put in it later once the glue gets set up a little bit. Let me put my glasses on. I have sanded the inside of my post and my bottom piece with 150. That's going to be our final sand is 150. I went ahead and sanded it because it's going to be too hard to get into this joint with a sander once it's all put together. So I went ahead and sanded at 150. I didn't sand the rest of it 150 because after we get it all put together we can do our surface sanding easily before we put our half lap joint together. All right, let's go ahead and glue this up. We're going to we're going to spread the glue. Because of the tightness of this joint, any glue that we put on is going to be squeezed out just by the process of sliding the joint together. So I'm going to spread this with my finger and try to drive as much glue into the surface of the wood as I possibly can. We're not worried about squeeze out except along this line right here. We don't want to squeeze out along that line. That would be too hard to clean up. But we're going to make sure we get plenty of glue on the surface of our lap joint. This is almost like a tongue and groove. In fact, basically that's what I would call it, is a tongue and groove. It's a lap joint, but it's a tongue and groove type lap joint. All right. Turn it up like this. Here comes our upright, and we're squeezing it down there. Okay, fits tight. You can see how the glue has squeezed out the bottom side of that. Okay. Now this is a little little cutoff of ten degrees. I'm going to just use it as a to make sure that my angle is correct before I put a clamp on it. And then I'm just going to put a clamp on this joint right here. And let that set for a few minutes. And we're going to do each one of them the same. Then I'm going to come back and drill and put a screw from each side and a plug on each one of these joints so that it'll be really extra strong. Let me go ahead and get to that point and then we'll come back. We have our upright legs all glued together and our clamps on it. While the clamps are drying, or while the glue is drying and our clamps on it, I have a little foot that is going to be going underneath the ends right at the base of our upright. Now, the little foot is just a uh, three quarter inch piece that is going to be cut with a 10 degree angle. Let's go over to the saw and let me show you how I'm cutting those. The foot is going to be out to the end of our upright, which is at 10 degrees. So I have cut the end of this board at 10 degrees and it is the width of our leg stock. I have installed two sacrifice pieces here and as I push it through the saw, then I will be able to pull this out of the way of the saw with my hand. I'm going to try to keep my hands as far away from it as I can, but this is the way that it's got to be done in order for it not to bind in an angled cut. I have my saw set at 10 degrees. Let's cut a piece. And just like that gives us the little foot, 10 degrees here, 10 degrees here, and our leg will be like that. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get the rest of them cut. And then after I sand, now that I've got these all glued together, after I sand this area here and at the bottom and get all the glue and the unevenness off, then this piece will fit underneath there. Let me pull this clamp up out of the way a little bit. This will be fitting underneath here just like that and create the little foot. I'll go ahead and get the rest of those cut. Now there's one other thing that we're going to cut with our, our 10 degree while we have it set up. I have cut two pieces of stock here. 
They're three and a half inches wide. Those three and a half inch wide pieces, once this is put together with the cross piece, there's going to be a top plate that will also be a cross piece made of these three and a half inch wide pieces. It will also have a half flap joint. And that is how the tabletop will be anchored to our pedestal pieces here. We have our legs all together now and we have them sanded to 120 grit. I want to show you the little foot. This is what the little foot that I was talking about. We just glued and nailed that on from underneath and then sanded it flush on all the edges. There's the end of it. And we put a screw through the tongue and groove portion of our assembly and put a plug there so it's a little decorative plug. We're getting ready now. Like I say, we've all sanded. Now we're going to go back and we're going to take our trim router and we're going to go around all of the edges with a quarter inch round over. Except for up close to our lap joint. We'll do that afterwards. But we're going to go ahead and go around everything now and that'll soften and make a nice smooth leg. Anyway, you can see how that's going to make a nice round on the out, outside corners of our leg all the way around. We're going to do that to everything. I'll come back when I'm all done with that and we'll show what it looks like when we put the two pieces together in our cross. We have our two pieces of our pedestal all sanded and ready to go. I went ahead and drilled some holes on the bottom side of the small stretcher so that we can put some screws and tie it together. What we're going to be doing we're going to put some glue. We're going to put it together like this. Whoa, see how that slides in there like that? And then we're going to tip it up and we're going to put some inch and five eighths screws in there that will hold that tight. And then we're going to put a clamp on it also, just to make sure that there's a clamp on it while the glue dries. Let's put on some glasses so we can see what we're doing. Let's put some glue. We don't want so much glue that we make a mess, but we want plenty of glue to make sure we have a good adhesion on our lap joint. And there's our lap joint together. Oh, look how nice and smooth that is. That's just the way we want it. Now, I'm going to tip it like this. Put our inch and five eight screws. Now these screws would hold it tight enough that we probably wouldn't have to put a clamp on it, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it because it'll make me feel better. Okay, and there we are. And now a little clamp from underneath, right in the center. Okay, and we're going to give that a little while to dry, and then we're going to bring our trim router back in and complete our route to the corners and sand that, and then our pedestal part is done. Okay, there is the pedestal to our table. This is the part that goes on top that actually connects to the table itself. This will be attached to the top of the legs and then attached to the bottom of the table. We won't put that on right now because we're going to finish this separate from the legs and then when it's all finished and we'll put it together and the top will be a different color than this and so it will be finished separately also. Let's get working on the top. We got our top back from our wide belt sanding and it just is a beautiful top and like I say taking it and having it wide belt sanded was sure worth the time and the money but to be quite honest with you to have all our wide belting done was only about thirty dollars for this top and for the pieces that made our pedestal. So it wasn't too bad at all and it saved us a lot of time. We're going to cut a 42 inch round circle. 
we're going to use a circle jig. The circle jig, you put your collar of your router onto your circle jig, measure the distance from the edge of your cutter to the hole that will give you the distance. So half of the distance, this is the radius. Now we're going to be using a spiral cutter. This is a half inch shank spiral cutter. So it's a good heavy spiral cutter, a spiral cutter. The cutters are in a spiral, just like a screw. There's three of them and that spiral helps pull the chips up and out of the way as you're routing. So that's the reason for a spiral cutter. Plus it cuts them much smoother. And so what we're going to do, this is the face side of our table. We're going to turn it over and put a hole in the center, just a, enough to put a screw in. I'm also going to put a piece of quarter inch down on my bench because I don't want to ruin my brand new bench. This is the back side of our table. So the underneath side of our table, and we're going to mark the center in order to be able to cut a full 42. I think I only made it just a little bit wide. I'm 45 wide. So that would be 22 and a half basically for the center. Okay. Yep. We're good. And I am 42 and a half. So I didn't make it very much wider. So 21 and a quarter would be our center this way and 21 and a quarter. So we're going to give us a little pilot hole right here. Our top is one and an eighth thick. So we don't have to worry about going through. Now let's go ahead and we're going to put our router motor in our collar. We don't want much of our bit to be out just yet. Only just barely enough to hang on to the collar because we want to make our cut, our circle. We want to make it in successive cuts. We don't want to do it all at once. Okay. That holds good. Let's tighten our motor into our collar. And I want to be really tight. So I'm going to use the wrench here to really tighten it in more so than just my finger tight, because I don't want this to get away from me. Okay. So there is, you can see how much the router bit sticking out about a half inch. We don't want to tighten it down because we want to be able to turn our jig like this. I'm going to get me some hearing protection also because this could be loud. Okay. We're going to go ahead and do the whole circle. We're going to set it down and we'll come back when we've got this all cut. After completing the majority of the depth of our circle cut with our circle cut jig, we have installed a small trim bit in our trim router, and we're going to go ahead and trim off the rest of our circle. And there we are with our tabletop completely cut out. Now we're going to flip it over. This is the top side of our table. We're going to flip it back over to the bottom side. We're going to sand our edge and sand our bottom of our table, the underneath side of our table and put a small round over and get that all cleaned up on that side. Then we'll turn it back over to our top side and I'll catch up with you there.
After sanding our table to 120 fine on the underneath side, I've installed in my little trim router a 3 16 round over and I just did a practice run on a scrap piece here and that's just exactly what I want. Just a very small round over to soften the edge of the underneath side of our table. I don't want a lot of detail on my underneath side, I just want it to be soft, that sharp edge. So let's take this little trim router here. You can see how that just softens that edge so very nice, but it's not a lot of detail. We're going to go all the way around on our table, and then we'll sand the bottom of our table to 150, and we'll also sand this little edge that we just put on there so that it's ready to smooth. Then we're going to flip it and do our detail on the top. We now have the underneath side of our table all sanded to 150. We put that nice 3 16 soft edge on the bottom. Let's roll it over. This is our top side. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to sand it 120 and then we're going to put a chamfer edge and I'll show you the chamfer edge in just a minute but first I'll, get, I'll go ahead and get it sanded and get my router set up and then we'll come back and we'll show the route. I have sanded my tabletop to 120 grit fine. 150 will be our final sand. I tested out my little chamfer bit. It is just a little angle cut like almost a 45 degree cut. Here's our round over that we did on the bottom and now our chamfer on the top. So that is going to be the edge of our table. This is our bit that we have set up in our little trim router and you can see that it has a little angle cut, just a little chamfer. We'll go around now and put our router bit, chamfer bit to work and make the edge to our table. We have our tabletop all routed and sanded. I wanted to talk a little bit about the router bits. This is the router bit we just used, the chamfer bit. I bought a set of 70 Yonko router bits from Amazon. And this is all the router bits that I used to make this table have all come out of this kit right here, except for the big spiral bit that I bought separate because there's not a spiral bit in here. This is a great source of router bits. I use it a lot. Okay, now what I did is after I had it all done, I went through, I sanded my edge one more time with 150. I took a little scrap of 150 and I hand sanded my chamfer so that it was nice and smooth. And then I sanded with my palm sander across the top until I was perfectly smooth. Now it was easy to sand because of the fact that we had gone and had it wide belted at that cabinet shop that has the wide belt time saver that we used. Our final sand on the top was much easier because of the wide belt sanding that we had done. Makes it nice and easy to get a really good sand job. We're now getting ready for the staining portion of our table. Our pedestal is going to be stained. Both of them, we're using Minwax for both. Our pedestal piece is going to be stained with gun stock is the name of the color. It's a little bit lighter. Our table is going to be stained with mocha, a little bit darker color and when we get to the top, I want you to stick around. We've got something special we're going to do to the top. We're going to turn it over and do the underneath side first, stain and seal the underneath side of our table, and we'll stain our pedestal at the same time. Let's get started. Okay, we're getting ready to put our stain on. We're going to do our underneath side. This is the underneath side of our tabletop, our mocha stain. I've shaken it and stirred it. I'm using a staining sponge. Now, you can buy staining sponges lots of places, but Quite honestly, I get mine from Harbor Freight. I think they're the best. And then we're going to be cleaning it with a paper towel. So let's go ahead and just get going on it. I like to apply my stain in a circular motion. If you've watched any of my videos, you've always seen me do this. The reason I do is because this gets it down into the grain of your wood. And it just really makes a, a good staining application. To get it down in there. Okay. And I stain a little portion. And then I go back and I clean it with just paper towels. All 
right. Look at the way that brings out that grain. Oh, I love that. And like I say, we have something special we're going to do to the top of our table that you'll want to stick around for. This is the underneath side. We're staining it mostly to make sure that it's sealed. We want to make sure our table is sealed top and bottom. After we get done applying our stain, we're going to be putting a sealing coat of finish on this to make sure that it's all sealed. Okay. Back with our paper towel. We have to allow an hour of drying time is what's recommended by Minwax on your stain and we'll give it at least that, maybe a little bit more if we can make it work out before we apply our sealer coat. Okay. Oh, look at that. Okay, let's turn it around here. Now I'm not staining the edge. I'm gonna stain the edge when I stain the top. Right now I'm just doing just the bottom. I want my edge to match my top. So I want my stain to be applied at the same time so that there's not any kind of a line where one stain started and one stain ended by doing the top and the edge at the same time. I eliminate that possibility. If there's a line, it's underneath on the underneath side of the table, which won't show. Okay. And now we'll use a fresh paper towel to dry it and clean it. The most important part of staining, believe it or not, is sanding. If you haven't sanded your wood correctly, your stain will never come out right. So be sure to spend the proper amount of time sanding to make sure that your finish is your perfect finish. Okay. All right, we're going to stain our pedestal the same way and we'll come back after we have things stained. Well, I was hurrying along to get the tabletop all stained and I missed a step. We're putting on a glaze finish over the top of this stain to give it a ceruse effect. You've seen some of our ceruse videos before, hopefully, and if you haven't, go back and check some of those out. This is the first time that we'll be doing a glaze over a stain to create the ceruzing, but what I forgot to do was to wire brush our wood to enhance the grain. And so I had to come back after our stain and do that. And that's what I'm doing now. You can see I've already started over here and I can feel the grain here. This is very smooth. So what we're doing is we're just taking our wire brush and we're just Scrubbing on our finish. And what we're doing is we're digging out a little bit of the material out of the softer part of our grain. So this wide grain part here on oak, this is harder than this. And so we're digging out some of that soft grain. It also happens to be where most of the stain is on this particular piece. So as we're going along, we're lightening up the finish. You can see how dark this is compared to this. This has already been wire brushed. This has not. And you can see how it's kind of digging up some of that material. Very, very fine little pieces of, of stained wood. It's not very much, but it's just enough to kind of enhance the grain and allow our glaze a place to hold in and give us a little more of an effect. I'm going to go ahead and finish wire brushing the top. Then I have to restain because now I've ruined my stain. So I've got to go back and restain. And then we're getting ready to, after we stain, after we wire brush, stain, then we seal. 
We'll put a sanding sealer on, then we glaze. We'll go to that point. Okay, we've restained our top after we had it wire brushed and we're ready for our sanding sealer coat. I bought this sanding sealer. It says you can either spray or put it on with a brush. We're gonna put it on with a brush and then wait for that to dry. I'm putting me a little drip board around the outside so that I don't drip it all over my table. And we'll do the edge first and then we'll go to the top. We're putting on a, a thin coat with a brush, making sure that we go from side to side along with the grain. That'll give us a nice even surface. Sanding sealer seals the stain and it is fast drying and sands real easy before you get ready for your final coats. You also put sanding sealer between the stain and a glaze coat. And our glaze coat is next. So, and you can see how easy this just goes on nice and smooth. Spreads very nice. Back and forth, side to side. Okay, our sanding sealer coat is dry. We're going to take a sanding sponge and sand it down. Now the sanding sponge is just a sanding sponge that I purchased at my retail paint store and the grit on it is just labeled fine. So that makes my, brings my sanding sealer down to a smooth surface. Okay, we're getting ready for our glaze coat. Now I took a damp cloth and wiped up all the dust off of this, so we're ready to go. For our color coat, we're using Pro Coat, Unicoat, Hard Wax, we're using True White, and we've mixed it half and half with an activator that they send along with it. And that is, according to their instructions, that is a final coat. We can put this glaze on, wipe it down real good, let it dry, and that is a hard finish coat that you can walk on. They do it for floors and everything. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to let our glaze mixed with the activator be our final coat. And so we've mixed it up here. Be applying it with a brush and wiping it off with a paper towel. We're going to do a little section here. I guess I need to be doing the edges while I'm doing this. All right. Let's wipe this so we can begin to see. how this is going to turn out. And you can see how that glaze settles down into our wire brushing to give it a real ceruse look. I'm going to take a few minutes and get the whole top done and let you come back and see it when it's all done. Okay, we're getting close to being done. I just want to talk a little bit about how to put glaze on. We're putting it on with a, a big wide nylon brush this time. But you want to make sure that you get plenty of glaze on and that you work it down. Now, see as I spread it here, see how it's not down inside of the grain? 
Go back and just make sure that you work it down into the grain so that your glaze gets all the way to the bottom side of that grain that you spent your time working with the wire brush to open up. And so you just make sure that you get it down in that grain like that. And then you come back with your paper towel. Take off the excess. And look how that highlights that grain. paper towel here and make sure we get that cleaned up okay we're getting real close here to making this look great With our top finish all done, we're now ready to attach our pedestal. The first thing we'll do is roll it over like this. And there's our underneath side. Let's bring our pedestal over here that is all complete now. Okay, now, like I say, we have a long wing and a short wing. We're going to put our long wing across our grain so that it will hold our grain flat. We've drilled holes for our screws and we made them a little large, which will allow for a little bit of expansion and contraction in our tabletop. See, our center is right there, so we're pretty close to center, but let's take some measurements here. We went ahead and found our center and got it all lined up to center. So we're now just putting in inch and five eighths screws. And we're gonna snug those down. Complete our attachment of our pedestal with more inch and five eighths through the other cross piece. Let's come around here so you can see how this is all going together. Okay. Alright, our pedestal is firmly attached and like I say, no glue and we've allowed for a little bit of expansion and contra traction in our screw holes so our table will have a chance to breathe. Now we live in the desert so I don't think we're going to have to worry too much about it but it's available if we need it. So let's go ahead and tip our table down to the floor. That's a heavy table. Okay. Oh. How beautiful. Okay, let's roll our table, our work table out of the way. Okay, we're all back here now done with our table. We did a great job doing a dupe on our round oak table that we saw online. We did five quarter thick for the top. 
We did a four quarter base, but we glued pieces together to give it a nice chunky cross base. We got it all put together and sanded out. We did a ceruse top on the top to give it a nice new looking finish that it, kind of a, a weathered barn finish. I really like it. But anyway, let's talk about how much money we saved. Now, remember the one that we saw online was over $2,500. We built this table start to finish, even including the finish, for $250. 90% savings. And that's the kind of savings that you can do when you learn how to build furniture here with us on Woodworking with Wes.